千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Eric Lin, where we delve deeply into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I am beside myself with excitement. Here is what forty-five looks like, and here is how it goes. Tao Te Ching forty-five. Great perfection seems flawed. Its function is without failure. Great fullness seems empty. Its function is without exhaustion. Great straightness seems bent. Great skill seems unrefined. Great eloquence seems inarticulate. Movement overcomes cold. Stillness overcomes heat. Clear quietness is the standard of the world. So there's Tao Te Ching chapter forty-five, coming in at ten lines. So this is a bit longer than the eight lines that we have seen in the previous couple of chapters. These ten lines will break down easily into three parts, as I will demonstrate. Before we go into all that. I just want to draw everyone's attention while we're looking at this chapter together. Please take a look at the beginning of line one, line three, line five, six, and seven. Note that we have a bunch of concepts: the concept of great perfection, great fullness, great straightness, great skill, and great eloquence. So these are the five points of greatness. These concepts are not as well known in the West as concepts like Wu Wei or Pu, the concept of simplicity. But they are important to the Tao. The reason why they're not as well known in the West is because the original, the original authors to Popularized the Tao, they themselves did not really know much about these concepts, and therefore they didn't talk about it.、Uh, this goes back to the 60s to the 1960s. So as a result, they're not as well known, but that's okay because today we will be getting into them deeply, and I will make sure to explain them in great detail. So now, let's take a look at the the structure of this chapter. To start with, take a look at lines one and three. I think you can easily see that there's a there are some repeating characters. So the first character is repeating from line one to line three, and so. Is the third character. Now, this gives us a pretty good hint that these lines belong together in one section. Now, there's more. Whenever we have correspondence that skips a line, we are automatically looking for a structure like A B A B. So let's see if that is the case this time. And indeed, from line two to line four, you can see that there are three characters that repeat. So even without knowing ancient Chinese, just by looking at the shape of the characters, you can tell that one, two, three, four 
are a poetic reiteration, and therefore we can mark them as one section. So looking at the translation, you can tell that this is talking about great perfection and its function, then great fullness and its function. So without going too deeply into that, let's continue on with our analysis. So what about the next few lines? I think the next few lines, it will be easy to pick out the repeating characters. You probably see it already. So this is good exercise to get into. Certainly, this is not something that you will see in any popular edition of the Delta G. So with the repeating characters for five, six, and seven, you should be able to tell that once again, just like lines one and three, you've got two characters that repeat from line to line. And they're actually the same characters. So overall, you can actually tell that lines one, three, four, five, uh, pardon me, one, three, five, six, and seven are the five lines that have the same repeating characters per line. Now, five, six, and seven belong together. They're not grouped with one, two, three, and four only because they lack the ABAB structure of the first four lines. So I think, I think you, can, you can see that, you can tell just by looking at it. So we're ready to assign five, six, and seven to its own section. So this leaves one last section at the bottom. And indeed, we can see that eight and nine have a repeating character right in the middle. This is the character that means winning, in this case, translated as overcoming, overcomes. So the middle character is also the middle English word in translation. And then the very last line doesn't have any repeating characters. It is just the concluding line. So now we see the three parts. We see the beginning, the middle, and the end. Or if you prefer, you can think of them as the intro, the body, and the conclusion. So as I said about this chapter, what makes it special is that it's a concept-heavy chapter. What we talk about great perfection, great fullness, great straightness, great skill, and great eloquence all very important to the Tao. Usually never get a whole lot of attention. We're going to remedy that today. So we'll get right into it, starting with the first two lines. And indeed, we will start with the first two characters, Chen. Now, as you can see, if I've isolated the first two characters for special attention, let's take a look at the pinyin. So, da means big, great, large, grand, vast. And then, chen. What does that mean? There is the big, and then there's chen. So, the second character means completions or to complete, completed, completion, to complete, completed. So together, it's something that is great for being very complete or perfect. So da chen, the totality is the perfection of the Tao. Hence the translation, great perfection. Let's explore the meaning. The greatest perfection of all is just a synonym to the Tao. So whatever the Tao is, it is the principle, the force behind everything in existence. Therefore, it is of the greatest perfection. 
it is responsible for all that is. So there's another level of meaning. And here, I want to remind everyone that the best way, the authentic way to understand the Dao Te Ching is to look at what it conveys in multiple layers of meaning. So this other layer of meaning is talking about Da Chen, great perfection, in terms of the highest level of human attainment, the greatest achievement. So this gives you an idea that we're going to talk about the concepts today in multiple levels. That includes at the, at the top, it'll be the level of the universe, the universal macrocosmic level, the level of everything. Then we will also talk about it in terms of another level that is the level of humanity what it means to be human. That's humanity, not just you and me, but all of us as a whole, the human species, if you will. And then finally, lastly, we also want to apply the meaning to the level of the self. That is a level of you and me when we cultivate the Tao. So three levels of meaning that we're gonna get into, the universal, the humanity, and the self. So for now, what are some examples of great perfection that fit into those different levels? The perfect orchestration of the cosmos where everything seems to be one grand choreography, where everything just happens, it happens at the right time. So that is the highest level, the universal, existential level. Then the perfection of the virtue, that's where we talk about the level of the self, the cultivation of the Tao. And then a skill at the apex of human capability, that's what we collectively human beings are capable of. And we'll see some examples of that. So let's, uh, let's explore the different levels in this idea of great perfection. Let's talk about the, the Tao of perfection. We've uh, spoken of the larger world, um, the cosmic, the universal. Well, we can begin by thinking about how the ancients approached this concept and keep in mind that the ancients had no concept of cosmology the way that we do. They did not have refined astronomy as we do. They do study the movements of planets and stars and constellations, but their idea about the universe itself was relatively undeveloped. But even before they get to the universe, even before they look up at the nighttime sky to see the moon and the stars and start to map out the constellations and study how they move throughout the year. Even before that, during the day when they look up, they can sometimes see amazing, breathtaking, incredible sights. There are amazing displays that hint at the perfection of natural laws. So on the screen, you'll see one example of that, that's just the rainbow. There are many other examples, perhaps beautiful sunsets, perhaps northern lights. You can come up with your own examples. There's plenty to see in the sky. That is amazing. And behind it all, they appear to reflect upon the perfection of natural laws so beautiful, so harmonious, and working so incredibly well. So this is available to us just as it was available to the ancients. So let's turn our attention to the nighttime sky, to the stars, the celestial bodies as they move around. I have a 
graphic here to represent that. So that's not literally what it looks like. This is more of a symbolic graphical representation of space. And as I said, the ancients could see it from their observation of the constellations. Now, of course, we have powerful telescopes, uh, observatories. We have many, many more tools that tell us about the condition, the way things are in space. Now, the number of tools that we have, the sophistication of the tools that we have, they actually tell us the same thing that the nighttime sky told the ancients that there's a perfection behind it all, that there's this amazing, incredible working of natural laws in perfect synchronization to bring about the sights that we appreciate. The more we understand about the cosmos, the more we appreciate the truth to this. So that's another point that I want to make probably several times today, and that is, it is oftentimes amazing to see how well the Tao Te Ching maps to our modern knowledge, modern conceptions. Yes, the ancients did not have a sophisticated science and technology like we do now. Despite that, we can extend what they thought about, what they concluded using the benefits of modern knowledge and everything still perfectly fits. This is actually kind of a surprising thing, everybody, because when you survey the ancient works, when you look at the holy books of the many traditions all around the world, it is more likely than not that with the vast majority of the scriptures, holy books, etc., you need to be selective. You need to discard some of it that are obviously primitive and wrong, and then extract the rest that are still applicable in modern times. The Tao Te Ching is an exception to that. 100% of the Tao Te Ching can be applied directly to our world today without any loss of fidelity. That is the reason why we have books like the Tao of Physics that do that exact same thing, that they compare and contrast the ancient thoughts, the conclusions with modern physics and find a, an amazing correspondence between the two. So anyhow, the perfection of the Tao is just as evident in ancient times as they are or should be today. Let's move on. Aside from the sky, the heaven, the universe, you know, the solar system, the galaxy, etc., I want to move our focus closer to the here and now, to the level of our existence, your life and mine. The Tao of Perfection, how do we apply that to humanity as a whole? Well, we know that in any endeavor, in any human endeavor, any field of human effort, we can see some amazing accomplishments. We can, we can use so many different examples. Let me present you with the first one here. The Tao of Perfection can be seen in the amazing grace and strength of world-class athletes. And here, I'm using an easy example, that of a gymnast. Now, it doesn't have to be sports. We can also see it in the arts. We can see incredible coordination and control of uh, ballet dancers, and here's a a great example of that. You know, there's something so perfect and so beautiful embodied in those movements. And it doesn't have to be 
things that we do with the body as as in athletics or performance arts like dance it can be any kind of human endeavor it can be other kinds of performance arts like music for instance and here's a virtuoso music performance on the piano so the Tao of perfection can be seen in the achievements the apex of human achievements the the edge of human capabilities the pushing the envelope that's when we touch perfection itself so let's continue on and talk about implications of the great perfection so line one let's continue on great perfection seems flawed now i want to address the last character there the last character the fourth character of line one let's isolate it sure and I know it doesn't look like the pinyin. The pinyin looks like it should uh, maybe be sounded off like Q. It's spelled like Q. Well, this is another weakness in the pinyin system. The actual sound in Mandarin is ch. What does it mean? Well, imperfect, flawed, but not in the sense of mistakes, distortions, errors, being twisted out of shape. It's not that kind of imperfection, not that kind of flaw. In this case, it is the imperfection of something, of a missing piece, a missing component. So in this context, the meaning is specifically about something that's missing, something that is lacking or incomplete. If you have a group of good friends and you do everything together, you arrange time, you, you know, to go out together, have meals together, chat together, have coffee together, etc. But then one day the gang is together, but one person is missing. That would be true. You are missing an important part of the group. So it's imperfection. It's a flaw but it's in the imperfection and flaw of something that is missing something that is not there so think of chi as being like the following if you think about a photograph where the face of individuals has been blurred out so the faces are missing and you can't really recognize who that is because the face is blurred um you know maybe with the mosaic effect so that will be true it is missing identifying factors it is missing the ability it's missing the uh, sufficient clarity for you to recognize who that is another way to think of true is like if you have a jigsaw puzzle that is mostly completed but there are some missing pieces and you can't find them that will be true so here's a graphic to represent that. The, in this particular case, the jigsaw puzzle pieces form a greater picture. But with the piece missing, part of the picture is also missing. So it's uh, imperfect, it's incomplete. That's what Xue means. So keep that in mind. It becomes important when we want to understand what everything means when we put it all together. Now, let's put line one all together. Let's assemble it all together. This is where a student can really benefit from some guidance in studying the Tao Te Ching. Without guidance, this stuff is harder to understand. Some of the Tao Te Ching that we have looked at is quite easy, I think, to comprehend, but this is not one of those. This is a place where the student can really benefit from uh, guidance, from experience guide. So line one, great perfection seems flawed. 
let's isolate it and let's talk about it. So here's the here's the overall here's the overall idea overall question. How do we apply the concept of Chu to the great perfection of the Tao? We just got done talking about how great perfection can represent the working of, of natural laws. It can be the great perfection that human beings attain when you perfect an art or a skill. And great perfection can be the virtue that you perfect for yourself in Tao cultivation. Okay, that's all, that's all fantastic. Now, what is it about those interpretations that can lend themselves to Chi? That's the part that's more difficult to understand. So let's let's take it one by one. We'll start with the with the macro level or the what I call the universal or the cosmic level. Let's start with that. So first of all, the laws of nature are perfect already perfect in terms of universal harmony. They work the way they do. We don't understand everything about them, but we can see by the evidence of the existence of the universe itself that the natural laws are working together in unison perfectly. So the laws of nature are perfect. The components of nature from the smallest scale to the largest, all move in accordance with the Tao. When I say the smallest scale, I'm talking about atoms and molecules, you know, that small. Uh, and later on, we'll talk about the quantum level. Those are scales that are so small that we cannot see them without the aid of modern powerful instruments like electronic microscopes and so on. What about the largest scale? Well, there, I'm talking about not just planetary scale, not just, you know, stars and star systems, but the largest scales would be, would be space itself, outer space, would be the galactic scale, galactic clusters, that type of thing, the superstructures of the universe. Regardless of the scale that we're looking at, all the components of nature, from the very big to the very small, are all working together, are all moving together in this grand choreography, in this great orchestration, you know, orchestrated by an invisible hand, and for the lack of a better term, what is called the in invisible conductor, the Tao. Okay, now, as I mentioned, we human beings can see a lot of this. We can understand a lot of it. We certainly understand a lot more than we did before. You know, we understand more since ancient times. We have a, a greater, clearer, more detailed understanding of the universe than the ancients did, but we still can't figure out all of it. So when we have flaws in the understanding of the universe, that flaw is not in nature, it's not in the Tao, but it's in our theories about nature, in our calculations, in our formulas. So let me zoom in on that and talk about the flaw or the missing pieces in the great, great perfection that we discuss at the macro level. Let me use a slide to make that easy to understand. This slide is called Human Understanding of Nature. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see the different theories. These are unknown to the ancients. These are, again, things that match the Tao very well, uh, and we can use them as examples for the Tao. So theories on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the character Chi. Remember, that's a flaw or imperfection in terms of something that is missing. In this case, understanding or knowledge that is missing. I want to start with Newton's laws of motion. 
this was a grand achievement. The graphic that I have here, this is Newton's cradle, where you have the striking balls that transfer the kinetic energy from the, the ball that's being struck to the very end of it. And this illustrates Newton's laws of motion. You know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. What is the flaw? What is the imperfection here? Well, it is remarkable how well Newtonian physics work. We can use nothing but Newtonian equations to manage flights within the solar system, to predict with great accuracy the, the journey to the moon and back, uh, the trajectory or um, the orbits of man-made objects, satellites, rockets, the space shuttle, the International Space Station, all of these can be calculated to great precision with Newton's laws of motion. Where they don't work is when velocities approach light speed. That's the reason why Newton's equations work so well for us within the solar system because we rarely, we, uh, except in laboratory conditions, we usually never get anywhere close to the speed of light. Not even our most advanced rockets, none of it can even get close to the speed of light. So it's typically not a problem. But when we observe natural phenomena, when we make measurements of particles that move very fast, close to the speed of light, we know that Newton's laws of motion uh, no longer apply. So there's definitely gaps. There's a flaw. There's missing pieces of understanding using that theory. So then it has to be supplanted by something better. Einstein's theory of relativity. So this is uh, this was cause for celebration. Uh, it was a watershed moment. It was uh, an, a revolution in physics when Einstein's theory of relativity perfectly captures what happens to, to objects as they get closer and closer to the speed of light. And the graphic that I have to represent for that, no big surprise, it's Einstein's famous equation E is equal to mc squared, where E is energy. There's the equal sign. M is the mass. C is the speed of light, which is a constant. And then C squared. So that is the equation. Relativity has withstood the test of time and works extremely well under conditions where Newtonian physics would not work as well. But Einstein's theory of relativity also is flawed or imperfect, or I should say incomplete. Relativity, the big problem there is that it cannot describe what happens at the quantum scale. For that, we need something different. And Newton's laws of motion also do not describe what happens at the quantum scale where it is all about wave functions that collapse upon measurement. So quantum mechanics, set of equations that are proven to work extremely well at the quantum level. And the graphic that I have for that, this is a fanciful depiction of entangled particles in quantum mechanics. The idea is that two particles that are entangled in the quantum jargon, they can be separated by light years. And yet, when what happens to one of the entangled pair will instantly, immediately uh, be reflected uh, at the other entangled part of the pair, which appears to violate uh, relativity in that the speed of light should be the maximum speed limit, 
but not for entangled pairs. Anyhow, it doesn't actually look like that. Uh, actual entangled particles do not look like special effects. They actually look very boring and would not make interesting graphics. So that's just a representation. Now, what is the flaw for quantum mechanics? Well, it's also imperfect. It's also incomplete because there's nothing to tie it together. There's no theory of gravity, for instance, to tie everything together for the grand unified theory of physics. So when's that going to happen? Well, you know, perhaps if we have another genius like Newton or Einstein, we can hope to have the, the GUT, the gut, the grand unified theory. Right now, um, the foremost candidate for that is string theory, and that's far from proven. So what I'm trying to say here is that at every level of human understanding about the cosmos, we have flaws. We have things that we don't understand in our theories, not in the universe itself, not in the Tao, in the human understanding of it. So we are, we are missing a piece of understanding. We still are. So let me now address the concept of chue in the other manifestations of perfection. You guys saw this picture a few slides ago, depictions of human achievement, human attainment, virtuoso performance, virtuoso level of skills at the peak of human development, human capabilities, human attainment of perfection, so one characteristic is common to all achievements of humans at the highest level, and that is they are, they seem so natural and effortless. It's the same with the gymnast as it is with the ballet dancer, as it is with the, with the virtuoso musician. They make us look so natural. They make it look so easy, as if the techniques are missing. But the techniques are not really missing. The techniques are just completely integrated to these people. That's how they can make it look so easy. So easy, in fact, that's exactly what we say. Hey, you make it look so easy. We're overlooking the discipline side of it the sustained discipline over years, decades, a lifetime, the endless practice until the skill is totally integrated into their being, until the skill is something that they can use without thinking. They have mastered the technique of no technique. So in our human perception, looking at them perform, it's just like the imperfect understanding of physics, of the universe, etc. Initially, we think that, hmm, so natural, so flowing, as if the te techniques are missing. But no, in fact, the techniques are present. They may be invisible, unnoticeable, but they're there. So it appears to be missing, but it's not. The universe, from the standpoint of our theories, appears to be imperfect, but that's our understanding. The universe itself is perfect. So I think you, you begin to see the correspondence between the two. So let's take a look at line two, and then we can explore yet another aspect of it. Its function, the function of great perfection is without failure. Let's isolate it. Now, I want to invite everyone to think about this line. Its function is without failure and apply it to the cosmic level, you know, planets, star systems, galaxies, etc., and also the human level. So at the macro level, let's do that one first. The laws of nature, we know the laws of nature were present long before human beings came around. 
you know, our species has a very short history compared to the age of the universe, you know, roughly 14 billion years. So the laws of nature were around long before we came around. And we know the laws of nature representing the Tao, the laws of nature will continue to be present after, after we're gone. So the function of the laws, of the natural laws, from beginning to end, as it ever has and ever will be, it'll never fail. Regardless of what we do or fail to do, the Tao will never fail. The Tao will always function the same way it always has and always will. So from that perspective, we can see that the Great Perfection, synonymous with the Tao, although it appears to be flawed based on our imperfect understanding, its function is without failure. So that's, I think that's relatively easy to understand. And now let me hit you with a bunch of stuff all at once. At the micro level, the personal level, those who have perfected their art have mastered the Tao in that regard. So this means they become one with their skills. And that means no matter what happens, their skills are literally them. So the mastery of the skill cannot fail. And this is where I want to get everybody to expand on this to the personal level, the level of you and me, the self and cultivation of the Tao. Tao sages expand on this concept beyond athletics and performance arts to include all aspects of life. It's the same thing as when a musician attains virtuoso status with, for instance, the piano. When you perfect the virtue, it becomes a part of you. Just like the virtuoso piano player cannot fail because the skill is a part of that person, the virtue you perfect in yourself cannot fail because it is who you are. It's a part of you. You can change that. Let's continue. There's a little bit more to cover for complete understanding. So think about one more example. We can look at the Tao as the great balance in the sense that in the long run, everything evens out. That is, the circular working of the Tao is real. Karmic consequences are real. Sooner or later, Karma catches up with everyone. Now, we say that, and it sounds good in theory, but as we look at it, sometimes it's hard to have faith because we have all seen good people suffer while bad people seem to escape karmic consequences. Right? We have all seen that. So is it really true that in the long run, everything evens out? Well, here is a perfect example to say that, well, the Tao, the great balance, it's actually perfect. Its function never fails, but our understanding of it, like our understanding of physical laws, that's incomplete. That's limited by our human minds. So it seems flawed. The great balance seems flawed to us. But what we're pointing out here is that the Tao is still functioning in the background, even when it doesn't look that way. Karma is still functioning. It's just that our understanding is imperfect.
Therefore, what I want to do is to ask everyone to recall to mind this image. This is what I showed before in chapter 43 of the Tao Te Ching. This is the discussion that we had before about karmic consequences and the saying that we went through, 不是不报, 时候未到, what does it mean? It means it is not that there are no consequences. It is only that the time has not yet arrived. So we not being able to see the whole picture, that's normal. That's, that's just the way things are. That's our limitation as human beings. But the working of karma, the working of the Tao, the circular movements of the karma and the Tao, those have an inherent perfection. They will always work. They don't work on the schedule that we demand. They work on their own schedule. So as I said, I would like to summarize everything for you. The concept of great perfection, an important concept in the Tao, I want to summarize it in the following way. In this mini slide, you see that the heading there, Da Chen, the great perfection, we're gonna have the three different levels down the left-hand side, the level of the universe, the level of humanity, and the level of the individual. Then we'll talk about how the flaw or the imperfection, the incomplete aspect of it applies to that level. And then we will also talk about the part where it says the great perfection, uh, its function is without failure. So let's start with the easy one. At the universal level, the natural laws of the universe are perfect in themselves. What is the flaw? What is incomplete? Well, our knowledge of the universe is incomplete. Each level of the knowledge, when we advance in what we know, at each level, it has its own challenges. So as I pointed out, it was a challenge moving from Newtonian physics to Einstein's theory of relativity and then to quantum physics. And now we're going to have a brand new challenge in the grand unified theory. And nobody really knows when we're going to see the end of that quest for knowledge. So without failure, while regardless of the gaps in our understanding, the, uni the universal Tao continues to function. It doesn't care that our understanding is great or not so great. It's gonna start, it's gonna continue to work just as it always has. Now let's talk about the level of humanity. This is where I brought out the image of the gymnast, the ballet dancer, the virtuoso pianist. So at the highest level of attainment, human beings, we have the ability to approach perfection we can partake in the Tao of perfection. So what's the flaw? What's incomplete? Well, it's only, it's just like the way we look at the universe. It's only in the perception. The virtuoso performance flows so naturally, there seems to be an absence of techniques. And what about the part where it says without failure? Well, regardless of whether or not we can perceive the techniques of the virtuoso performer, the art or the skill that's been completely integrated, if you have that total integration, you can use that skill to express yourself. And the greatest performers in the world, they do that with the skills that they have mastered, they express themselves. They can do that as if the skill is an extension of them. When you have mastery of a particular skill, you can do the same thing. You can utilize that skill as if it was an extension of you. It will never fail. So that's how that applies. 
Finally, and I think the most important level is the level of the self. We perfect our practice of virtues until they become part of us. So this is different than becoming a great musician or a great athlete. This is about becoming a great human, a great person, a great individual. So what's the flaw? What's the incomplete? Well, someone who has a high level of attainment becomes ever more aware, even more aware of the flaws. And I'm going to uh, use another illustration for that in a moment. But basically, someone who has a high level of attainment becomes ever more humble. So what about the part where there's no failure? Well, once you have perfected a virtue so it becomes a part of you, that is who you are. You're not someone who has to remind himself or herself to be nice. You, you are simply a nice person. It is who you are, not something you have to remember. So that's the part where we say without failure. With those three aspects that you see in front of you, right here in this slide, you now have a complete total 100% of the concept of great perfection as intended by Lao Tzu. Remember, it is always supposed to be applied at different levels. We've now done so from the most personal to the vastest, the most grand, largest scale imaginable, the scale of the universe itself. Let's continue. We're now on to line three. Gray fullness seems empty, so this begins with this discussion of the first two characters. And just as great perfection is synonymous with the Tao, that's Da Chen, here, Da Yin, great fullness, serves the same purpose. But it's for another aspect of the Tao. It's not so much like the example of the natural laws that we talked about, and the orchestration or the choreography of everything that's embedded in the cosmos, in the universe, at every scale, it's not so much about that. It's about something else. We'll talk about that something else in just a moment. For now, I want to focus on the last character there. Okay? This character usually gets mistranslated as something like rinse or wash, maybe fill with water. That's a modern Mandarin context. I want to be very clear with everyone that here we have another instance where the ancient context is different from modern Mandarin. In the ancient context, it is synonymous with the character Kong, it is used in a related meaning to rinsing and washing. It means empty or emptiness. It's related to the meaning of rinsing or washing because those actions to rinse and to wash, those are what clears out the dirt from the object that you are rinsing or washing. So it is devoid, it becomes devoid of dirt. It becomes empty of dirt. So it's actually used in that context. And that's why the translation that you see here says, great fullness seems empty. And now I want to explore the entire line together. So first of all, why do we call the Tao the great fullness? Why is it synonymous with the Tao? Well, it's because the Tao itself contains infinite possibilities. It's got limitless potentialities that are all just waiting for the right moment in time to manifest in reality. So it's full, it's bursting at the seams. At the same time, 
it is also empty or at least it seems empty because it's a void it's an empty void there's nothing in it but then something comes out of nothing now this can be seen as a paradox but it really isn't it's an obs observation of the way that nature works those who have not encountered the Tao before may find this puzzling. Those who do not understand the Tao may be puzzled by this idea of being full and empty simultaneously. If you find yourself feeling a little puzzled as well, that's totally normal. Um, you know, if you if you like, you can definitely type something out in the Q and A section. But let me explain. Something that is full or empty simultaneously, that's not a paradox, everybody. That's actually something that we see all the time. For example, let me use this uh, very common everyday example for you. Think about the empty bottle as the most common example. And let me bring in a picture of it. We see empty bottles all the time, right? We don't really think anything of it. We can all agree that the bottle is empty. It's empty of liquid, what it used to contain. But at the same time, we all know that the empty bottle is full of air. So the bottle is both empty and full simultaneously. So then the question, is the bottle empty or is it full? Which is it? The answer is yes. So that is exactly the same context, the same sense that we see the Tao. So then let's talk about line four. Its function is without exhaustion. Exhaustion in this case, uh, this is not this is not meaning fatigue or being tired, not that kind of exhaustion. It means something being exhausted as being used up. That's the meaning. The last character there, Chong, that's actually the character for poverty. So that's uh, when something has been totally used up, exhausted, no more. So then. The Tao is infinite, and that's why we say its function is never exhausted. It can never be used up. When we talk about the Tao as the source of universal creation, it's a continuous process. It's not something that happened, you know, during the seven days of divine uh, creation in the Bible. That's not the way it works in the Tao. In the Tao, Creation is happening all the time, every second of every day. In that continuous process, more keeps coming from the source. It's never used up, so it never stops. Now, this applies to all human beings, to you and me, to everybody. And that's because we all have the Tao in us. We can experience this this uh, never-ending source of creativity at the personal level. The creative mind is like the Tao. So there's nothing, uh, there, there are no objects, there are no material objects in the mind, obviously, but there are ideas that can be brought to life, meaning there are ideas that do not exist as a concrete, solid, everyday object, but the idea for something can be turned into reality. You have to you have to take action to acquire or shape it or to make it modify something to make it fit your idea. But it starts with the intangible. It starts with the emptiness. So the creative mind is like the Tao. Just like ideas get turned into reality in the Tao, the emptiness produces things. Moreover, when you connect your creativity to the Tao, great ideas never stop. So in summary, 
I think you I think you get the idea. The DAO is the source of everything, and your creativity is the source of all things, all changes in your life. You have ideas all the time. You have ideas to get something, to buy something, to discard something, to change something. So these ideas, when you understand how to tap into it, take advantage of the fact that it's a never-ending source, you end up like a creative powerhouse. You, you will never suffer from writer's block. You always have new, inventive, and interesting ideas to try. It's a well that never runs dry. So now, just like we did for the great perfection, I want to do a mini summary for the great fullness. These are the two headline points of greatness for this slide. So this is especially important. And just like great perfection, great fullness that you see here, it applies equally in the various levels of existence. So first of all, as we talked about, at the universal level, the Tao is a universal source. It's filled with unmanifested energy, that is, intangible potentialities waiting to become real. So this is, this is full, this is the gratefulness, but it is also empty. Well, how is that? Here, I can use an example. This is actually something that we see all the time. When we look at the seed of any plant, we know just by understanding how agriculture, how agriculture works, we know if we plant the seed, we will grow plants. And these plants will, in turn, give us more seeds, leading to more plants. So one single seed can give rise to countless plants, numerous plants, but then there seems to be nothing much in it. This is common to any seed. You can cut it open. There's certainly not plants in miniature form inside the seed. There doesn't seem to be much in the seed at all. And yet, it is hiding the potentiality for the countless numerous plants. Numerous plants to come, all waiting for the time to manifest in reality, which means they're all waiting for the time and circumstance to grow, to develop into, into plants. So without exhaustion, yeah, we can see how that works because this process goes on forever. The power of universal creation continues on indefinitely. It never runs out of gas. So how would this apply to humanity? Well, as I mentioned, the Tao in all of us, in you, in me, in everybody that we know, the Tao is a mini engine of creation in our own lives. Now, all we have to do is look around us and we can see that there are so many things that started out as thoughts. What kind of thoughts? Well, like I said, ideas. Maybe daydreams, maybe plans. You know, my plan is to put together a nice space where I can work. So then those ideas, those plans, those thoughts, they become real. They become, you know, maybe a nice desk, maybe a computer desk, maybe it has a laptop on it, and so on. So intangible ideas becoming concrete, become actual physical material objects. Ideas include things like, maybe I should buy that. Wouldn't it be nice if I had this? So as pure thoughts, as ideas, it seems empty. But we know it's actually full, full of potentialities. Without exhaustion, well, human creativity Human ideas, inventions, innovations, like the Tao, it's an infinite source. If you understand how to tap into it, you never run out of ideas. So lastly, let's talk about how this applies to the self. 
how does this apply to cultivation? Well, we know that great fullness in this context can be the great fullness of a life that is filled with the goodness of the Tao. Empty, how does that apply? Well, to be empty in the context of Tao cultivation, the meaning is that you must practice the Tao in a humble way. That you must not be full of yourself. Your life can be full of the goodness of the Tao, but you must not be full of yourself or the joyous fullness will never occur. And that is the part where we say without exhaustion, that is without running out, without being used up. When we follow the teachings properly, the Tao is an endless source of joy in our lives. So there you have it. This right here, this one slide is the complete 100% understanding of the concept of great fullness as it applies to the largest level, the universal level, and the personal level, and everything in between. So I want to uh, take a moment to focus on this whole idea of practicing the Tao humbly. This is something that uh, I mentioned how important this is, how central this is to the Tao. We have seen it in previous chapters. Here it is reiterating in a different form. So I want to bring in another sage to share with you what he has said about this whole concept of practicing the Tao in a very humble way. This is Mencius, Mengzi in Mandarin. So there's something very interesting and meaningful that he said about the proper mindset to cultivate the Tao. It looks like this, and I know it doesn't make any sense to you. That's okay. I'm going to explain exactly what it means. So this is a saying from Mencius, Mengzi. So before we dive into it, I want to point out, as we usually do, um, some repeating characters. So first of all, let's pick out the easy ones. If you look at the second character that's repeating per line, hopefully you recognize this. This is the character for person or people. It can be singular or plural. The character right next to it is a character for no or not. This is a negation character. So forget about the other characters for the moment. Let me talk about the first character in this second part. This character, fan, means to reverse. Here, it means to turn your gaze inward, to reverse your gaze from looking out, outward to looking inward, to reverse the gaze, to reflect and review upon your life. And then we have another repeating character here. This is a possessive character. So we can, depending on the context, it can be its, their, his, her, your, my, etc. Okay, with those characters out of the way, we can now go line by line. Ai ren bu qin, fan qi ren. That's the first line. Seven characters, a collection of four characters, followed by a collection of three characters. What does it mean? Some of you guys already know that the first character is love. So if you string them together, love, people, know something. Well, here's what it means. If you are loving to people, but they do not get close to you, qin means dear, D-E-A-R, dear, like dear to the heart, close to the heart. If you are loving to people, but they do not get close to you, well, what I would say is that you're doing something wrong. What Mengzi would say is that you should reflect on your benevolent compassion. Okay, let's do the rest and then I want to explain the, the entire context of this. Then we have zhi ren bu zhi, fan qi zhi, the second line. What does it mean? 
if you try to lead people, but they do not follow your lead, well, reflect on the wisdom of your leadership. And then lastly, 理人不达反其境 What does that mean? If you are courteous to people, but they do not respond in kind, reflect on the sincerity of your respect. So I want everyone to look at all three lines together and get the overall mentality, the overall idea, the overall paradigm. Is that the default assumption is your practice is flawed in some way? That there is a missing piece in your cultivation somehow. Why? Because human understanding, human wisdom can be woefully limited sometimes. It is why our theories are not perfect. It is why we sometimes forget the discipline necessary to achieve human perfection. When we cultivate the Tao, the more we cultivate the Tao, the more we need to self-reflect. Thus, if you are loving to people, but somehow they're not getting close to you, despite the love that you are putting out, then it's time to reflect on your benevolent compassion. Are you expressing it? Is it authentic? Are you genuinely feeling it? Because people can detect something that is fake, and they will react accordingly. Therefore, the default assumption is that there there may be something wrong in what you originate, and that's why you get back something that's not what you expected. If you try to lead people. But they're not willing to follow your lead. Well, then you have to take another look at the leadership that you are providing to them, that you're offering to them. They may disagree with what you think is a wise course of action. It's time to take another look at that. So again, the more you are able to perfect the Tao and the virtues. The more you're going to be thinking and reflecting about what you're doing, that is maybe imperfect or incomplete. So, lastly, if you are giving people a lot of courtesy, but they're not courteous back to you, they're rude. Well, then you need to reflect on the sincerity of your respect. It may be that you are insincere, and when people detect the phoniness. The fakery. They respond in kind. They don't respond to what you do. They respond to what they perceive as real. So all of these together, you can see. Even though Mencius is supposed to be in the Confucian tradition, what he says has an exact correspondence to the first four lines of Tao Te Ching forty-five. Okay. Let's continue on to line five. See all of these concepts: the great this, the great that. These all require additional explanations. These are not meant to be easily understood. These are not meant to be intuitively obvious. Line five: great straightness seems bent. This is another one that can be difficult to understand without guidance. So let's let's break it down. Let's analyze this. First, we isolate it. Then, here's what we know: in mathematics, we know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I think everybody、uh, pretty much knows that. Now, that's that's the abstract world of mathematics. How well? Does the abstract apply to the real, the practical, the everyday world of our reality? We know that in the real world, the shortest distance between two cities—you know, pick any two cities you like—it's a road, and the road is constructed in accordance with the terrain、uh, that you must traverse. Maybe it's going through hills. It's maybe crossing a river at some point. Maybe it's going up the mountain. 
one side and down the other. So it's winding its way through various types of terrain, right? So we, we get not a straight line, but we get the most advantageous or the most convenient path given the constraints of the terrain. So we know that this is the fastest and most direct and most convenient way to go to get, to get from one city to another city, but it's got a lot of curves. So this is a pattern that's, that sages have seen repeats a lot in life and in different ways. Hence the line. Great straightness seems bent. You want the most direct path in your travels. It's got a lot of curves. The path of cultivation is like that. Dow cultivation is like the most direct path from one location to another location from where you are to the next level of your spiritual attainment. The path of cultivation is direct, it's convenient, it's easy, it's easy to travel. But people take a look at this kind of terrain, you know, metaphorically speaking, uh, applying real world travel to the Tao, to Tao cultivation, people take a look at that and instinctively, they want to cut across using shortcuts. So hopefully, based on experience, you already know that this doesn't work too well when you are attempting to drive from one city to another. Hopefully, you know that you should be sticking to the road, stay on the road as you get from one city to another, one location to another, uh, in a quick and convenient way to try to cut through from one place to another. It's, it's not gonna work. You're gonna tip over your car, you're gonna get yourself stranded, um, it is not a good idea. In Dell cultivation, it definitely doesn't work. So overall, you see the picture that Lao Zi is trying to paint. He's talking about the great straightness of Dao as a path of cultivation. It seems bent although in reality is the most direct and convenient path. So the simplicity of the Tao is compromised when people want to take shortcuts. The shortcuts actually complicate matters. Let's continue with this train of thought for just a moment. So bottom line is this, Tao teachings are straightforward. Zhi, great straightness, but people sometimes assume it can't be that simple. I do hear that sometimes. When people hear about the authentic Tao, the reaction I sometimes get is, oh, no, 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 it can't be that simple. Indeed, in the West, what I have seen is that is a lot of twisting of the original simple ideas into something that's more complex that no longer resembles the original, or sometimes it's the very opposite of the original. This results in sort of a westernized, watered down version of the Tao. So let me share with you some examples, and then, and then we're gonna need to end our meeting on that note. I think you will find these interesting though. The westernized version of the Tao on the left-hand side, and my suggestion on how we can return to the original simplicity of the authentic concepts. For instance, I have seen this. I have seen people say, the Tao has no rules. When you run your life by rules, you've left the Tao. Oh, really? Well, something that I know about the Tao is that the Tao follows nature, nature follows the Tao. The Tao can be synonymous with nature, and I know as we talked about today, nature has natural laws. In a similar way, a Tao cultivator has a personal code of honor. 
So the suggestion that you, as a cultivator of the Tao, should follow no rules, I think when you look at it this way, with the simplicity of, of the original, clearly this westernized concept doesn't work. Here's another one. And I'm pretty sure you've heard this before. Who's to say what is right or wrong? Why can't we regard things just as they are without passing judgment? I'm positive you have heard something like this or a variation thereof. Here's the original concept. Here's the authentic Tao. There's no absolute right or wrong that applies to everyone. You know, what is right for you may be wrong for me, etc. But there is personal right and wrong that applies to oneself. There had better be a personal right and wrong. That is, we had better know right from wrong. That's the doubt. There's no cop out. There's no excuses or rationale to avoid passing judgment on what is right or wrong. That is very westernized. Another one. Cultivation is too intentional. You know, when I talk about Tao cultivator, sometimes I give this. Cultivation is too intentional. Nature has no intentions, so we also do not need intentions. Here's the original concept. It's perfectly natural for human beings to have thoughts, ideas, and yes, intentions. You were born with a brain naturally, you have cognition naturally. You utilize your cognitive abilities naturally, which is going to result in thoughts, and that will include intentions. There's nothing you can do to avoid that. Another westernized version of the Tao, which I also hear quite a bit, sometimes in a joking manner, sometimes in a glib way, to demonstrate how wise one person thinks he is, ultimate wisdom is realizing you know nothing. I think that's overly simplistic, and I also think it's wrong. Here's the original. Ultimate wisdom is knowing how best to apply what you know. It is not realizing that you know nothing. It is in the practical application the best way, the most beneficial way to apply what you know. And then one last one, having goals is a Western concept. It's better to live without goals. This is very common and it's very wrong. It is not a Western concept. It's a universal concept. Having goals is a universal concept and goals will be something that we can all utilize skillfully as we can with everything else. So when someone says the Tao can't be that simple, my question would be, why can it be, why can it not be that simple? Why should it be more complicated than it has to be? When someone says, well, the Tao is supposed to be what I make of it, I would say, just like natural laws, the Tao is the Tao regardless of what you think, what you make of it. It's no different from gravity. You can make of gravity what you will, but if you fall from a great height, there's going to be damage. And then lastly, I also get, well, what makes you so sure you're right and everyone else is wrong? Well, I am positive because when it comes to the Tao, I listen to the actual guidance of the ancient sages. What I study is not modern writers who get that knowledge secondhand and don't have a firsthand understanding of the ancient writings. Okay, time flies when we're having fun and it's already a little bit past the time, so we need to go to our summary for today. So applying the Tao teachings, uh, specifically Tao Te Ching 45. 
I want to focus on the first two points of greatness. We spend quite a bit of time on them today. The first one, as you recall, is great perfection. Here I have suggestions. I want to suggest that in order to get with this particular concept, that you want to choose a virtue to perfect for yourself. Whatever that virtue is that you want to work on, set up a plan of constant practice. Eventually, this will lead you to the attainment of mastery when it becomes a part of you. So if the virtue is something like humility, as we have talked about, practicing humbly, then you're going to want to monitor your actions and words for arrogant expressions. Secondly, gratefulness. So emulate the Tao as the universal source of creation and put your own creative powers to work. And this is where I'd like to remind everyone that you are a mini engine of creation. You have the power of, create, of creating everything in your life. So when faced with a problem, I want to encourage you to consider multiple solutions, different angles, different perspectives. I want to encourage you to move around obstacles, just like water flowing around rocks. There is always a way. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time. May the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.